Hey everyone, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Carol Ann Flood, and I'm the worship director here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our mission is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus your whole life, or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help you draw near to the person of Jesus, be challenged and encouraged by His Word, and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you are in Him. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to uh, be back with you again. Um, Welcome. Can we just say thank you to our worship team? Carol Ann, thank you so much for uh, just leading us so incredibly well. I was kind of lost in the moment. All of a sudden, I was sitting down I, after that, and I was like, oh, I got to get up there. I got I to do something. Uh, uh, yeah, we've already been in the presence of God this morning, and that's just an incredible thing uh, that we just get to dig in a little bit deeper. We're in week number three of this series called Make Space. If you're just joining us online as well uh, for this, welcome. It's great to have you with us. We've been talking about uh, the story of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. And really what, what this story is all about is how the people of God began to seek God again for themselves. Not just the leaders, although they did too. Not just the older generation. Not just those who already knew the Lord. But all of God's people began to seek God again. And so uh, today we're going to take the next step and look a, a, again at this story and how it intersects with our lives. And so I don't know if you've noticed this. I have been noticing this a lot lately. Have you noticed that it's very, very hard to make uh, stories about consumerism inspiring. And yet, that's what our culture is trying to do all the time, right? I, I've been watching football again uh, because it's the fall, you know, and everything's back on. And so uh, I've been noticing just the commercials that come on. It's like they try to make stories about consumerism really inspiring to us. Some of you have seen it's like the little boy who, who's he's into football. And so the dad notices that. And so what does the dad do? He buys a gigantic LG TV to watch the football games. Like, really, is that, is that supposed to be inspiring somehow? Uh, it's like, it's very hard, but it's like to make stories inspiring, like, oh, you know, I was on Amazon the other day, and there was this suggested item, and I, I just knew when I saw it, I had to have it. And so what I did is I clicked on it, and then two days later, the Amazon truck pulled up to my house, and I got that dopamine hit when I saw the package there, and then I opened up the package, and then I had it, and it's, it's mine now. It's not very inspiring, is it? And yet I think about like stories that inspire me. Uh, I actually, in in my computer, I have an email folder that I've been keeping for about 15 years now. And this email folder is full of emails from you guys, from frontliners. And uh, specifically, it's about uh, emails that I've gotten after we've talked about the spiritual discipline of tithing. So if you don't know, the way we talk about tithing is it's, the, it's returning the first 10% of our income back to God. We find that all throughout scripture. And so over the years, 15 years or more, I, I've had this email folder where every time we've talked about it, I've got emails from you guys who have said things like this, like, oh man, I decided to take that step. I decided to start tithing. And when I did, and it's just story after story of how God you know, provided. Sometimes these crazy stories, like supernaturally, he just provided. Some of those I've shared with you over the years. Other ones are just like spiritual breakthrough that happened, not even necessarily connected to finances or anything. Those are some good stories. Those stories inspire me. That's why I keep them. That's why I keep that folder. Um, Other stories we think about. Four years ago, I got the chance to go with my son, John, to Ukro, Ethiopia. It's a community, a small town uh, that is south of Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And if you don't know Frontline, we, um, we have a care point there. Then there are 136 kids and their families that are sponsored by you guys. You guys give on a monthly basis uh, to sponsor these children who are part, connected with this church there. And so my son and I got to go to Ethiopia with a group of Frontliners. We got to see this care point and we got to actually go to the home of Bethlehem and her family, uh, this little girl that we, our family, we've been sponsoring for the last several years. And I went, I went there, it was so inspiring to watch not only the impact that, you know, you have this like monthly giving that's happening, but uh, also just uh, the, the, the money we were giving actually ended up becoming like a small business loan. So what they've, the, her family's done with it is they've kind of taken it and they've begun to make injera. It's a, it's a, like a food staple there in Ethiopia and they're experiencing ongoing just sustainability in life. And, and what was so inspiring to me about it is, you know, you go and you have this idea, well, I'm like the hero, and, uh, you know, and they're like the sidekicks in my hero story. 
And I remember just going and being there in their house, you know, with their family and realizing, no, actually, it's the other way around. It's their hero story. I'm just getting to be a sidekick in their story. I do so little with so much. They do so much with so little. It's inspiring. It's inspiring when you get to see that. Also, over the years, we've had different families at different times who have actually tried to, who've given away a car here at Frontline. So it's people who have like a car they don't need anymore. They could sell it for some money. And so, but instead what they do is they actually give it to the church to say, hey, if you know anybody, that's happened multiple times over the years. Uh, the most recent one, uh, 2019, right before the pandemic, there was um, a family who's connected to the block. Uh, their kids are in our children's ministry. And um, they had this car and they said to Pastor Amanda, our children's pastor, he said, hey, uh, we got this car. Do you know anybody? And she was like, not really. I don't know anybody who needs a car right now. Within a couple of weeks of that offer being made, there was this, uh, mo- this mom um, here in our community also connected to the block. She's killed in a tragic car accident. And she left behind a uh, single dad now and these two young kids and, and also they have no car because the car, the only car that they had was actually in this uh, crash that, you know, took their mother's life. And so Amanda got to connect this family who had a car and needed to give it to this family who had just gone through this crisis and desperately needed a car as if to say, God already was looking out for you. He's with you in the midst of this and he knows your need. That's a good story, isn't it? The, the, the reason that those kind of stories inspire us, it's like we're hardwired to be inspired by those kind of stories. And, and the reason is because those stories aren't just about somebody getting something, like what consumerism would be. Those stories are about someone sacrificing and giving something so that someone else could receive something. We are hardwired to be inspired by those kinds of stories. So we're in the, as we look at the tabernacle this morning, the question we're asking with this week of this series is the question, what did it take to build the tabernacle? So if you've been joining us, we started out week one, we talked about who was the tabernacle for and why a tabernacle, why did, we build, why did they build a tabernacle? And then week two, last week, David talked about uh, what was in the tabernacle, like the actual items in the tabernacle and how they all pointed to the person of Christ. Today we're talking about how in the world did this thing get made? There's a story about what, what did it actually take and how did it get made? Believe it or not, there was no Amazon truck in the desert. There was no, like you couldn't click on something and the truck would pull up and you'd get that dopamine hit and be able to get whatever you wanted. How did, how did the tabernacle get made? So that's the story we're looking at today. So we're going to be in Exodus 25 is where we're going to start and just kind of trace that through. Um, so if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. It's going to be on the screen or if you're watching online, it'll be on the screen there in front of you online. Exodus 25 verse 1 says this, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose hearts prompt them to give. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Now what I want you to see about all, you know, when we first kind of interact with this story, I just want you to see like the tabernacle did not, you know, materialize spiritually, supernaturally in the wilderness. God didn't just say, okay, here it goes, poof, and there it was. There was a cloud and then there was a pillar that led them. And we'll talk about that, you know, later on in this series. Those, those parts were God moving supernaturally. But, the, but God didn't just sort of make this thing materialize. The people actually gave an offering in order to make it happen. The people of God literally made space. The series is called Make Space. They literally made space. Many people think uh, where they, you know, where this offering would come from is as the Israelites left Egypt after their time of slavery. There's a story about how they, they plundered the Egyptians. Some of you know that story. And this was just like their only provision they had in the desert. And, and they were being asked to give it as an offering to make space, this tabernacle for the Lord. Then it says, uh, go, go to uh, chapter 35. This is the moment where they're actually taking the offering. It says, then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence. And everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service, and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, are you noticing a pattern here? All who were willing, all whose hearts were moved, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds. Bro- bro- brooches? Brooches? 
Brooch, how do you, I don't even still know. Bro brooches, okay. It's like my grandma's jewelry. That's all I know. This is um, whatever that is, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Now, I, I love that because if you notice this, no one's being forced to give. There's no coercion here. There, there's no guilt. This isn't like a tabernacle tax that's being collected. You know, no, no one's saying, okay, hey, look, we, we've got to build this. The government's coming in saying we, this, this has to be done. So there's going to be a tax. You guys are all going to have to pay your part. That's not what happens. That's not how this thing gets built. Who is it built by? It, it was built by all who were willing. It, it was built by those who ha, whose hearts moved them to give. In other words, it, the, the people who gave to this offering to make the tabernacle happen, it was people who said, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. I want to be a part of some, be, something being built that will not just serve me and my generation and this consumeristic kind of thing, but I want to be part of something that's going to serve the generations well beyond my time. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. That's who this offering was for. So how many people do you think gave, right? I mean, a handful, half a dozen <laughs> I mean, literally, if that's, if that's like your plan for how to build the tavern, hey, anybody whose hearts are willing to give, like nobody's really compelled to, just, you know, nobody has to. There's no tax. Just if you want to, awesome. If, if you just want to be part of something bigger than yourself, I mean, what, you think I don't, maybe a dozen at the most? I mean, this is going to take a long time, right, to collect the amount of money they're going to need to build this tabernacle. Take a look at the next chapter. This is uh, chapter 36, starting in verse 3. So they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of construction on the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. They were not asked to do that. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Did you catch that? They, the people literally had to be told, Moses had to get up and make, like, stop giving. Stop it. Quick. The, the pile of money is just too big. We don't even know what to do with this. It's way more than we need. Stop, please stop giving. It wasn't just like a handful of people. It was all the people, and it was morning after morning. They just kept bringing more and more and more. They just wanted this so bad. They wanted it, and Moses is like, stop, quit. You can't give any more. You're not allowed to. That story is in the Bible. That's a pretty good story, isn't it? I haven't had to give that sermon ever. Stop. Just We need more stories like that in the church today, don't we? More stories about what we want to give to, more stories about what we're for and what we want to see happen, that, that we would be willing to just radically, be radically generous with what God's entrusted us with to see it happen. We need more of those kind of stories and less stories about what we're against, what we're angry about, what we're willing to protest. Because, why? Because those stories inspire people. They, they, they draw people in. When, when someone's willing to sacrifice what they have in order to give so that someone else can have something. It's, it inspires us, and I would say maybe it inspires us because it is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? The way Paul describes it in Corinthians, that Jesus, though he was rich, became poor on our behalf so that through his poverty we might become rich. It's, it's the core story that binds us all together. And it, it's inspiring because that's who God called us to be. So the question uh, we want to ask then this morning is, what does this tell us about God? Right? Because believe it or not, this story isn't in the Bible just so you would read it and go like, wow, that's really inspiring. This story is in the Bible. The reason it's survived is because it's supposed to tell us something about who God is and who we are as his people. So why is it there? What, what does this tell us about God? Here's what I, I would say. I would say this tells us that God doesn't just want to build his church he wants to use people to build his church and bless others. God doesn't just want to build his church. He does. He wants to build his church. And God is powerful enough. Trust me, he could do it any way he wants. But the way God chooses to do it, the way he chooses to build his church is to use people 
to build his church and to bless other people. In other words, God's dream for you is not that you would become a consumer. His dream for you is that you would become a contributor in the kingdom of God. That you would be a contributor to seeing his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. That's God's dream for you. That's his dream for me. That's what he wants for us. Now, we're talking about, so far, this story about the tabernacle, it's it's about finances. It's about the people of God all coming together and giving extravagantly and radically to see the tabernacle of God made. But when you get into the New Testament and we start to talk about the church, what you realize is that it's more than just finances that God invites us to give in order to build his church. So I want to look at this together. This is Romans 12. It's a, it's a moment where Paul, the Apostle Paul, is, is writing to the church in Rome, and he's trying to talk to them about this is how the church operates. This is how God made the church to work. It was, it was his idea, not our idea. This is how God designed us to work together. Romans 12, starting in verse 4. It says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So the metaphor that Paul uses here for the church to help people understand how the church works together is that of a human body. He, he literally says it's like a human body. So just like you, you, we have you know, fingers and we have toes and we have arms, we have legs, we have all, the, all these body parts. And those body parts aren't sort of like disconnected with the mind of their own kind of floating out there. They only function, they only serve their purpose as they are united and connected with the rest of the body. Paul says that's how the church is. That's how we operate in the church. So, so the, the metaphor is that Jesus is the head of the church. He talks about that more in Ephesians 1. And he says, we are the body of Christ. We are, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the way Christ manifests himself in this world today. This radical generosity of the gospel manifests itself through you and through me. And he says, basically, God gives each one of us spiritual gifts When you came to the Lord, when you gave Jesus lordship over your life, by the Holy Spirit, you were given a spiritual gift. But I don't know if you caught it in that passage. He's not saying God gave you a spiritual gift so you could just be awesome out there, kind of disconnected on your own. Like, hey, I'm good at this. I have this spiritual gift. What what he's saying is God doesn't just give spiritual gifts to people. What God actually does is God gives spiritual gifts to the church through people. Do you catch that? God didn't just give you a spiritual gift so you can be out like, I'm really good at kids ministry. I'm not involved, but I'm just, I'm just really good at that. It's just something God's given me a gift to do. No, no, God gives spiritual gifts to the church, but he does that through people. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. You and I, we are the way that God manifests himself in this world today. That was his dream. That's how he designed it to be. Now, that sounds great, doesn't it? Awesome. We're all in agreement. That just sounds like a a beautiful picture, a great metaphor for the church. Here's the problem. And here's what stops us so many times. Here's what gets in our way. Here's what keeps us as the church from really uh, going forward of what God's dream for the church would be. And here's what I'd say. Oftentimes we're fine with making space for God's grace and mercy in our lives. Right? And up to this point in the series, we've been talking about that. Like, man, this whole story of the tabernacle really is about a group of people who begin to seek God and say, God, I want to make space in my life. The first week we talked about that, that line, anyone inquiring of the Lord, God, I need you. I need you in my life. And we're great with that. We're fine with making space for God's mercy and his grace in our lives. We recognize we have a need for God. That's where it all begins for us when we come to this place where we recognize that we have a need for Christ to be our Savior. But... We're not fine oftentimes with then making space to be a tool of his grace and mercy to others. In other words, we're fine with God. I'll make space in my life for you to bless me. Yes, please bless me, God, all day. I need that. That's good. But what we're not fine with oftentimes is is making space and saying, God, will you use me and allow me to be a conduit of your blessing to other people in the way that you want to do that? So we say things like, well, you know, I, I just, I don't have time. 
I don't have time to serve, right? I don't have time to serve in a ministry team. I'd love to. I just don't have time. My kids are in sports, right? I mean, for those of you who have kids in sports like me, it's like, yeah, it's, nobody has time. We don't have time. Or we say things like, man, I would love to give. I would love to step into this idea of tithing and, and, and you know, living into that. But I'm worried, like, what if I get to the end of the month and I just don't have enough left over at the end of the month to do that? And understand the tithe in, the, in Scripture is called the first fruits. In other words, it's the first 10%. That's what we offer to God. You always have the first 10%. You might not have enough left over at the end for you. What we're talking about is making space in our lives to be used by God for his kingdom. Right? Maybe some of you got involved. Maybe you've been involved serving before. Maybe you've served, maybe you've been involved in, and uh, maybe you got burned. Maybe you've been hurt by the church. Maybe, the, you know, something happened. And so you took a step back. Maybe you were involved before COVID. There's a, feels like there was a whole bunch of people that just kind of said after COVID, like, I'm stepping back. I'm going to quiet quit. And you, you just quiet quit the church and you never made it like an official announcement about it. If that's you, if you step back, if you, if you walked away, just consider this today, your official invitation to take a step forward. God doesn't just want to, to bless you. He wants to use you to be a blessing to the church. That's what he wants to do. I was talking with, a, a, actually, I was talking with someone this past week. And what they said to me, I, and I get it. I get totally what they were saying because I've said things like this too in my life. Uh, she, she said, uh, I just need, you know, I just need the church just to be a place where I can just come and receive right now. Like, I'm just in this place in my life where I just, I need, I need to just be able to come to Frontline and just receive. And here's the thing, like, all day long, I hope that's, I hope that's the case for all of us. I hope Frontline is the kind of place where you can come and you can receive and you can connect with, with God and that he begins to, to, you know, bless you in your life through everything that happens here. But here's the thing, with this particular person, she's been here for over 10 years and she's never taken a step, gotten more involved. And at some point you go, at what point... Does God want to do something more in your life? And the way that that's going to happen is for you to stop saying, I'm sitting here ready to receive. I I'm ready to step forward and say, yes, God, please. I'm going to make space in my life to allow you to, to use me to be a conduit of your blessing to others. For many of us, we're stuck in our spiritual growth. We're stuck in our spiritual lives. And we keep thinking, well, it must be some more. I'm not, I must need to have some more information put in my head. Something else must to get, need to get downloaded to me. There must be some Bible study I've missed. I need more. And it's like, no. You got to take your feet and take a step forward and start activating your faith and living it and saying, God, use me. And that's when we see our spiritual growth actually go to the next level. Are you willing to make space in your life for him to use you? That's the question we're asking today. The tabernacle didn't just materialize. God's people made space in their lives to be used by him to build it. Now, it's funny how these, uh, the timing of these sermons work. So um, I'm, I was preparing this sermon and literally I realized, oh, wow, like I, I'm, I'm not the greatest at this either. I actually uh, need this message and this challenge this morning uh, more than anybody. Um, so about a year ago, I just felt a strong prompting from the Holy Spirit. I felt like God said to me, hey, uh, your neighbor, Brian, I, I want you just to go and build a relationship with that guy and just share Christ with him. I just really, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Uh, God will regularly, there, there's just like people that he'll just put a burden on my heart for, or not like an audible voice or anything, but I'll just get this very strong impression. Like this is a person that I know that I just need to go build a relationship with them. I just need to just be willing to just sort of make space to be in their life and just, uh, you know, speak whatever God gives me to say, to, to share Christ with them. And so uh, here's the thing. My neighbor, he works um, a second shift job. So in other words, he's not ever home when I'm home. We're, we, always, I, we hardly ever see each other. And uh, over the last year and a half or so, he, his adult son moved back home in their house with he and his wife. And so I just noticed like he's really busy dealing with that. And then he's, he works a second shift job. And so it was like, when am I going to, how am I going to approach my neighbor? The only time I ever see the guy is when he's out like mowing his lawn. And, you know, like you don't want to be like that weird neighbor who comes up like, hey, what kind of lawnmower is that? I mean, it's like, what, how do you, how do you even like <laughs> in an unawkward way start a conversation like that? And so I just kept feeling this prompting from God, just saying, no, you need to go invest in that guy. Just build a relationship with him. And so uh, what did I do with that? I ignored it successfully. And I, here's what I told God. I just said, look, this, it's just weird. I don't know how to do that. They're, we're never at home at the same time. So if you just make it obvious, like if you just put him right in my path to where it's just inescapable, there's, then fine, God, then I'll, I'll do something. I'll say, but I'm not going to like go out of my way. That's what I said to God. 
um, a little over a month ago, the, ambul the ambulance showed up at his house. Uh, it was the middle of the day. We all saw it. All the neighbors saw it. Everybody saw it. And about a week later, uh, the funeral for his son uh, happened. And um, it turns out uh, their son had moved back home because he was struggling with his mental health. Um, and they didn't say how he died, but I've got an idea. So I've been thinking about my neighbor over the last month or so. I've been thinking about, I have four sons. Uh, two of them are in college age. They all four still live at home. I think about what it would be like to come home every day to a house where he is no longer there, but all of his stuff still is. That would be unbearable. And so uh, I was out on a walk a couple weeks ago. Uh, Carrie and I were out on a walk together. My wife, Carrie, and I, we go on walks every day. And we walk all around the neighborhoods that we live in. And so we're walking, and I was just pouring out my heart to her. I was just saying, like, I just feel so terrible. Because I, I had shared it with her a year before. Like, I know God's prompting me uh, to build a relationship with my neighbor. And so I was like, I didn't do it. I haven't done it. And now this whole thing has happened. And I was just telling her how just terrible I felt. And she's listening, and she just goes, yeah. She goes, you really blew it. God did not give her the spiritual gift of empathy. That's not something he blessed her with. She's like, yeah, you really, you messed that up. Yeah, you did. And so we're, we're having this conversation. She's showing me no empathy. And I, I kid you not, I can't make stuff like this up. We we're, we're having that conversation. We turn the corner. We're walking down our neighborhood. And my neighbor is out at the end of his driveway, leaf blowing the grass clippings uh, off the end of his driveway. And we're on the sidewalk. We are going to walk right beside him on our way back home. And Carrie looks over at me. and She's literally just like... But you hate when your spouse is like with you on stuff like it's you can't hide. She was just like, well, you know, you couldn't ask for a better opportunity. Are you going to? So, so we walked by him and, and we just began, we stopped him and we talked to him. And we just said, listen, we heard about what happened with your son. We're, we're, I'm just so sorry. I can't imagine what you're going through right now. And we just listened to him as he talked with us and shared with us. And then we just said, uh, listen, we're going to be praying for you. And we want to be here. However we can be here, uh, you know, we just want to be here for you. And here's the thing. I don't know uh, what God's going to do with that. I, I, I have this sense that that story is not over. I, I have no idea what's going to happen next, but I believe he's going to do something. But here it is. If, if I am willing to make space in my life to be used by him. If I'm willing to be in spaces where it might not be comfortable, where it might be a little bit awkward, where I don't know what to say, uh, where I don't really know what to give, but I'm willing to just take a step of faith and go, okay, God, that's when he moves. That's when he works because he doesn't just want to bless other people. He wants to bless other people through you. Th this that we're doing in here, it, it's the church for sure, but you realize the church doesn't actually exist for those of us who are in this room or those of us who are watching online. We are the church and we exist for the world. You are the body of Christ. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. You are how he manifests himself and shows up in this world today. And this world needs the hope of Jesus, doesn't it? And so here's what I'm learning from this whole experience. I'm learning that he will not adapt to my resources. My resources have to adapt to him if he's going to use me. You could you say that about anything. You, you know, he won't adapt to my schedule. When it's convenient for me, my schedule has to adapt to him. I have to put him first in my schedule. My budget, he won't adapt to my budget my budget has to adapt to him to put him first. Do you see it? That's what he's called us into. I can't make anything happen with my neighbor. But the good news this morning is I don't have to. All I have to do is make space in my life to be available. And God will do the rest. Are you willing to make space in your life to just be available for how he wants to lead you by his Holy Spirit? 
He doesn't just want to bless you. He doesn't just want to bless others. He wants to bless other people through you. And so the final question here we'll just kind of land on is, how are you leveraging your time, your talents, and your treasure for him? Because those are the three areas, really, is, aren't they, in our lives? Our time, our schedule, our talents, the spiritual gifts he's placed inside of us for his church, and your treasure. How will you make space in those three areas for him to use you? Would you pray with me? God, we just bow before you this morning as your people. And we just recognize, God, that the reason we've been reconciled, we've been, the reason that we have been redeemed is because of this incredible act of generosity, radical generosity that you gave your life on our behalf, that through your poverty, you became poor so that through your poverty, we might become rich. And that act of sacrifice has broken the back of our sin and our greed and our consumerism and our shame. And you've made a new life for us, God. And so in that sense, God, we just thank you for the hope that we have that this isn't all there is, that we have hope beyond this world. And so this morning, God, we just invite you into the spaces of our lives where we just need you to expand our hearts. God, if you want to lay a burden on our hearts for someone, we say, do it. If you want to call us out of our comfort zone to serve, we say, do it. We say, yes. If you want to call us to give sacrificially beyond our means, we say, do it, God. We want to be part of something bigger. Not, not, none of us are being coerced. This isn't about guilt or coercion or some kind of a, a tax. This is just all whose hearts are willing. We just say yes this morning, God. We want to be part of, of your kingdom coming and your will being done on this earth, the same as it is in heaven. God, make us your body. We just ask to be your hands and your feet. And each one of us, God, would you show us how to do that? We ask in your precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We hope this message encouraged you in seeing who God is and who you are in Him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com forward slash connect. We look forward to connecting with you there, and we'll see you back here next week.